Well, as you know, there have been two phases of the impact of IT. From 95 to 2000, the um, IT impact was driven by production of information technology. Of course, uh, the United States is very uh, intensive in information technology production, uh, producing computers and semiconductors and, of course, software. Then the second phase took place after the year 2000, after the infamous dot-com crash in the uh, financial markets. And that was associated with an increase in productivity in the IT using industries. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the IT using industries, those are ones that are affected by the internet. So uh, trade, uh, financial services, uh, all the uh, things that are now uh, moving on to the internet. Now if we uh, think about the situation in Europe, uh, we can see that uh, first of all, uh, Europe is much less specialized in information technology production than is the United States. Uh, there's a lot of software produced in Europe. Some of the uh, strongest firms are based in Europe. But in terms of hardware, uh, Europe has a much more limited role than does the United States, or the Japan for that matter. So the impact of information technology from 95 to 2000 was much more limited in Europe uh, because of the fact that it was associated with information technology production. After the dot-com crash, uh, there was actually a decline uh, in the impact of IT in Europe, associated with the crash, of course, and uh, an increase in the uh, United States. Now, why was that? The reason was that in the United States, we have achieved a single market, not only in goods, uh, which is uh, characteristic of uh, the parts of Europe that are members of the European Union, but also in services. And as you know, the European uh, Union has uh, failed to achieve a single market in services. This is something that is uh, hotly controversial, and certainly the policy uh, circles in Europe are very well aware of this. But the impact of this is that the spread of internet-based technologies in the service and trade industries has been much less thoroughgoing in Europe than in the United States. So in the longer run, I think the uh, internet, of course, is going to penetrate into large parts of uh, the European economy. Unfortunately, the uh, fact that there is not a single market in services is going to be a barrier. However, uh, you know, there are specific areas where uh, Europe has uh, played a very, very important uh, role in terms of a unified market. Take the banking services, for example. There are now uh, Spanish banks uh, operating in the UK and Germany and so on. Uh, there are German banks operating in France. I mean, it's uh, something that is uh, moving in the direction of a single market. And, of course, that's something that uh, will enhance the incentives to use IT effectively. So in the longer run, I think that uh, there will be a tendency in this direction. But the only thing that would drive Europe uh, to the level of utilization of IT uh, technology that you see now in the United States would be a single market in services. Uh, Latin America has uh, had very impressive growth over the last uh, 15 years, uh, despite the fact that there has been uh, an occasional interruption, as in 2001 uh, here in Argentina, where we're uh, conducting this interview. But uh, the fact is that productivity, uh, in terms of output per unit of input, in Latin America is very, very high by comparison with the level of development so that you find in Argentina, in Chile, in Brazil, uh, all the leading Latin American countries a very high level of productivity. What is it then that accounts for the fact that these countries are only in the middle range as far as income and output per capita is concerned? Uh, that has to do with investment, not only in information technology, but uh, in other kinds of capital. And so long as that investment is deficient, I think that Latin America will be uh, growing at a rate that is uh, below potential. So studies of productivity make you optimistic about the state of technology in Latin America. On the other hand, they show a large gap between uh, what uh, is potentially uh, possible given the level of technology here, which I think is uh, quite comparable to what has been achieved already uh, in Europe. And so uh, I think there's a, a big gap here that uh, has to be filled and uh, what's needed is more investment.
including investment in information technology. The EU CLIMS project uh, succeeded, I think, beyond expectations uh, on the part of the European Union in getting to the roots of the differences that we discussed earlier between Europe and the United States in terms of the utilization of information technology. So the levels of technology that you see in Europe, the use of information technology, is definitely uh, behind the United States. And in order to understand that, it was necessary to go beyond the aggregate figures that are often used in these international comparisons between Europe and the United States and focus on the performance of individual industries. So if you now go back to the issue of uh, service sector productivity and the performance of the services, the EU CLEMS project revealed for the first time that it was market-based services, in other words, services that are provided by the private sector as opposed to uh, public uh, services like education and health and so on. It's those private services that really differentiate Europe and the United States. That was the major finding of the EU CLEMS project. So that was a tremendous success as far as uh, economic research is concerned. There was a specific objective. That objective was achieved. It uh, produced results that were very, very surprising and very, very, very illuminating, and that I think accounts for the reception, which has been very favorable uh, on the part of the European Union officials of the EU CLIMS uh, research. Many of the problems that uh, were identified in Europe can be seen in middle income countries. For example, uh, the countries of Latin America, uh, Russia, these are uh, countries that are considerably below the uh, achievement of uh, the main industrialized countries in uh, Europe, like Spain and uh, the UK and France and Germany. Uh, and uh, these are countries where there are similar differences that uh, have to be identified. I expect that market services will be an important part of the story of the underdevelopment of uh, middle income countries, the gap that I identified earlier for Latin American countries. But it remains to be seen, and therefore I'm very excited about the prospect of a Latin America CLEMS project involving the major industrialized, industrializing countries of Latin America. Uh, there's a similar project which we're uh, launching in Russia, which is at more or less the same level of uh, income. And uh, there are projects in Asia, in India, in uh, China, which are at much lower levels of uh, development, of course, uh, and uh, Japan and Korea, which are quite comparable to the leading European countries. All of these things, I think, will contribute to understanding the role of investment, and especially investment in information technology, uh, in world economic growth. And therefore, uh, I'm an uh, enthusiastic advocate of uh, these uh, CLEMS projects around the world. Let me make this uh, distinction again between production of IT and the use of IT. I don't see a great role for the production of IT in Latin America in terms of, uh, say, hardware, electronics, that type of thing. I think that uh, Latin American countries have a, a different comparative advantage that uh, trade economists uh, have spent a lot of time analyzing. But in terms of the use of IT, Latin American economies, uh, like uh, other middle-income economies, have a very major role for the trade sector and for services. These make up uh, sixty percent of uh, the average Latin American economy. Uh, if you focus on uh, market services and trade, maybe uh, fifty percent. So for half of these economies, uh, more or less the same uh, principles apply, namely that uh, it will be possible to stimulate a lot of uh, economic growth through investment in information technology. This is uh, investment that has to be uh, produced in a way that is adapted to local conditions and uh, therefore there is a role for uh, Latin American firms to uh, develop software that is appropriate to Latin American conditions, adapt hardware, networks and so on that are uh, appropriate to uh, conditions here. But uh, there's no doubt that uh, information technology is going to play a very important role in the future in uh, stimulating economic growth in Latin America. It's a uh, very, very complicated plan, as you know. It started out uh, three and a half pages long. The legislation that was finally adopted and signed by the president had 400 pages. So uh, it's a very, very uh, complicated plan with many different elements. As I see it, there are two basic elements. One is 
the idea of trying to rectify the financial uh, arrangements that uh, led to the subprime lending crisis. That's something that's quite unique to the United States. Uh, there are real estate booms all over the world, in uh, the UK, in Ireland, in Spain, uh, in uh, Hong Kong, and so on. But uh, the United States is the only country in which subprime lending, in other words, lending to people who really uh, couldn't qualify on the basis of uh, financial standards for uh, loans to buy real estate, were allowed to buy real estate and get loans uh, through uh, the so-called subprime lending. Uh, that's something that uh, then generated a whole financial industry of people who were trying to figure out some way to uh, reduce the very substantial risk that this entailed by uh, developing new financial instruments, selling to uh, new uh, uh, bearers of risk and uh, hopefully uh, compensating them and so on. The whole thing, of course, uh, ended up in a uh, disaster. So this is something that uh, the uh, Paulson plan would remedy by trying to have the government intervene in the markets for all of these uh, different kinds of securities, establishing prices that then would enable the financial institutions to meet the requirements for their uh, financial uh, viability uh, by uh, appropriate uh, repricing of all these uh, assets and eliminating these assets and replacing them hopefully by uh, safer and less risky assets. So that is a central part of the plan. I think that's something unique to the United States. Uh, it uh, poses uh, problems for the rest of the world because of the fact that American institutions, uh, financial institutions are so deeply uh, intertwined with uh, uh, financial institutions around the world. But nonetheless, uh, the root problem is unique to the United States, and by dealing with this problem, it's going to be possible to uh, alleviate uh, some of the difficulties that have arisen. The second part of the uh, problem, again, is uh, specific to the United States in the sense that as a result of subprime lending, the securitization, and so on, Many financial institutions are now undercapitalized, some of them very severely undercapitalized, the ones that have gone broke. For example, major investment banks like Bear Stearns and Lehman uh, and uh, Merrill Lynch uh, have all uh, given up their independent identity, been acquired, or in the case of Lehman, were allowed to uh, go bankrupt. That is something that uh, the government is going to deal with by equity investments in these financial institutions that are very familiar to uh, Europeans and Latin Americans. Uh, governments have uh, quite commonly uh, engaged in equity investments in order to uh, increase the uh, capital base for these uh, financial institutions in their own countries. Uh, the way that that will work out will be uh, specific to the United States, but it uh, sh certainly should uh, lead to a, a more stable uh, financial system. So overall, I'm uh, in favor of the uh, Paulson plan. I think that it does try to deal with the root cause, the subprime lending crisis, uh, and it does uh, attempt to recapitalize the financial institutions which have uh, been severely stressed by this uh, financial crisis. But I don't want to uh, leave this subject without uh, emphasizing a very important fact, and that is that the problems of the U.S. economy are far more serious than the subprime lending crisis. For example, the United States has been borrowing abroad now uh, in large uh, quantities for about 30 years and uh, has accumulated a huge international debt, which is not uh, sustainable. That's something that's going to have to be reversed. And uh, there's nothing in the Paulson plan that deals with uh, that uh, problem at all. There is a severe problem in the real estate sector. The real estate sector in the United States is a very important part of the economy, not as large as in Spain, to be sure, but nonetheless a very important part of the economy. And uh, the uh, real estate sector is going to have to contract. Another issue that uh, is dealt with, but only indirectly by the Paulson plan, is that as a result of the financial crisis and the uh, crisis that preceded it, uh, I referred to that earlier as the dot-com crisis, uh, we have had a uh, bloated financial sector. We've had a tremendous flow of resources into the financial sector, far in excess of what could be uh, permanently sustained. I estimate that the fa financial sector will have to contract by a factor of two. People who are uh, more uh, uh, 
uh, moderate than I am in their uh, views, think that the financial sector will have to contract by 20 percent. But there's no doubt that the financial sector is going to be permanently smaller, and that is going to be a very painful uh, adjustment process to reduce the size of the financial sector. So uh, Paulson is a good beginning because it deals with the immediate problems. But unfortunately, uh, there are long-term problems that uh, also need to be addressed. We have a uh, very peculiar situation in the United States. Uh, we have a situation where until 1999, uh, we had two separate banking systems. One banking system was based on investment banking associated with uh, issuing securities and uh, uh, raising money uh, in the form of both debt and equity for uh, business firms. And the other was the commercial banking sector, which was uh, dealing with retail banking and small business loans and personal loans and so on. The barrier between these two kinds of banking goes back to the 1930s and was repealed in 1999. So we made a very, very important change. We allowed institutions that had previously been barred from commercial banking to enter commercial banking and uh, institutions that had previously been barred from uh, investment banking to enter investment banking. The result of that was that we had an unregulated sector, namely in the investment banks, and a regulated sector, the commercial banks. The regulation of commercial banks has been pretty satisfactory. We've had a lot of difficulty, there's no doubt about that, uh, associated with mortgage lending mainly. But the unregulated sector of the investment banks uh, was a severe error in the uh, process of this legislation that led to the repeal. And so what we were trying to accomplish is what Europe, uh, European countries have accomplished many years before, namely universal banking, including both investment and commercial banking. But what uh, we achieved was uh, much more limited. We still had specialized institutions and unfortunately unregulated investment banks. It proved to be the case that in the stress associated with subprime lending and the securitization of subprime lending, that these institutions undertook much more risk than was appropriate. And therefore, there was a regulatory failure associated with the fact that these investment banks were allowed to be unregulated. All the major financial uh, problems associated with the uh, crisis that we're now in are associated with this failure in regulation. In terms of uh, future regulation, uh, we have to move uh, either in the direction of separating the two again, which I don't think makes a great deal of sense, or in the direction of a universal banking system with universal banking regulations like you have in Europe. And so that's the direction that uh, things have to go. The complication is associated with what I, meant, what I mentioned a moment ago, namely that the financial sector is now overexpanded, has far more capacity than uh, is required, and so we're going to have to achieve this change in regulation as the industry is shrinking. That's going to be a very, very difficult thing to do uh, in a uh, democracy where there are uh, interests which are trying to defend established positions uh, that unfortunately will not uh, have to survive in the long run. So uh, the answer is that uh, regulation was defective. Uh, it's clear the direction that re-regulation has to go. And uh, the issue that we need to face, though, is that the financial sector is overexpanded and the regulations have to be adapted to reflect that fact.